And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer to the temple, coming to us straight from from Helmgast and, and one of the myriad authors behind the re behind the rebooted form of cult known as divinity lost the one and only petter nalo hopefully i got the name pronunciation right how are you doing today man yeah uh, i'm surprised it was actually really really good uh, the pronunciation normally i'm called peter which is fine but uh, i no, did was, misread uh, that it, i did misread that at least once before i caught myself <laughs> Yeah, that no, but it's fine. Oh, I'm I'm fine. I'm drinking wine mm -hmm. since it's an open bar, yep. uh, so it's perfect. Mm -hmm. Um, so a bit of a tradition of mine is is to open with the humble beginnings. And with that mm -hmm. in mind, walk me through your first introduction to role playing games, and what was it that made it stick for you? Hmm. Well, I did. Uh... I did hear about role-playing games and see them in the store be long before I played them. I, I knew there were was such a thing called role-playing games. And I was always interested in fantasy and horror as a kid. Mm -hmm. And and uh, I, I went to the the you know the, the the toy store and there in the corner they had these boxes with like dragons and and uh, we had a very famous role playing game in Sweden that had like Elric on the front cover with like his sword Stormbringer held over his head. And it was like they looked so cool from everything else in Sweden in the in the 80s. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I, I bought uh, some of these games, but I didn't really understand how to play them. And the, the friends I had didn't play role playing games. So it was, I think I was. 13 the first time I sort of encountered a group that actually played role-playing games and joined them and uh, well I, I, I it was like discovering something that you have longed for your whole life up until that point and realizing yes of course this is what I want to do this is what I love so yeah I, I can't really explain what caught me I just like the imagination and like entering another world and like mysteries and danger and fantasy and sword and sorcery so for me I've got sort of spellbound by it mm -hmm. um, so 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 uh, that that's that's sort of the start for me I started with like fantasy and horror role-playing games nothing as dark as cult but it came fairly early on mm -hmm. Um, and when, when it comes to now, um, obvious, now obviously this is not the first rodeo when it comes to cults since it's, um, it's his, it's history traces, traces all the way back to the early nineties. I believe it, um, I believe it was first published in Sweden in, um, 1993, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, you are mistaken. It's 1991 actually. Oh. Um, I wasn't off, I wasn't off by too I wasn't off by too much. I think it, and it's possible that I may have con, I may have confused when it um when it came around um in English. Yeah, that, that it's probably in '93 it came the first English edition of Cult, I think. Mm -hmm. um, but so we're now ob, now obviously um Divinity Lost is a um, reboot of of Cult, but. Were you were you um, familiar with cult to a, to a degree before you before um, before the Devandi Lost project got started? Oh yeah, I mean, I I was fourteen when I bought cult uh, in ninety one, uh, and I uh, I loved it from the start. It was such an amazing experience for me to uh, because it was a cult. Of course, was based on like. Clive Barker and like Alistair Crowley and like dark magic and and erotic horror mm -hmm. Cronenberg movies Hellraiser of course and I hadn't had that much access to that in my younger years I I watched some slashers and 
but most of the horror I, I had experienced was this gothic horror, the like Christopher Lee vampire movies and that kind of thing. So for me, cult was also a, it was sort of the elixir of a lot of different art and movies and, and, and madness in one product. So when I was exposed to cult, I was exposed to all of that at once. So I, I was really mesmerized by cult when it was released. And we tried, I tried to game master cult but it always ended in disaster because I was too young and too inexperienced. So it was only like ended in violence and shootouts and wasn't that successful as, <laughs> as role-playing campaigns actually. But, uh, but yeah, I played it from the start. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, now when, when you say the start, are we, t are we talking, are we talking like first edition cult was when you started? Mm. Yeah. 91. I, we had a, role-playing game club uh, at, uh, at our school. So we met twice a week and played role-playing games there. And then we got our own sort of place to play role-playing games uh, in the basement of an of a old building next to our school. So we brought our games and played it. And um, uh, sometimes we tried to play cult, but we were too young, I think, for the themes of cult. So it just... There were too much weapons and too much like martial art rules. So it's sort of the horror aspect sort of drifted away into violent action. But I mean, it, it was fun and enjoyable, but it wasn't really, uh, I mean, it, I, I had much more enjoyment just reading the books and looking at the artworks than playing the game at that time. And which uh, which is definitely something I can understand. Now, um, I've I've ru I've um run my f I've run cult I've run cult a few a uh, few times over over the years, and even and even was one of the people dumb enough to try to try and get his hands on the uh, card game of all things. <laughs> um. Yeah. But when but um, the th whenever I would whenever I would discuss discuss it because the the idea of, of of it going with with aspects of religious horror was always um fascinating to, to me but there would always be dis, there would always be these long debates about um about some of the more for lack of a better term controversial aspects of cult and was that was that something that was ever brought up to you in those in those early days yeah, I mean, not sort of among us role-playing game friends. Mm -hmm. Sweden was then and is still a very secular country. So I think that it's like 4% of the Swedish population define themselves as like religious in a sense. So you have 96% of the population that is not religious. Uh, so the, the sort of, of course, you have a religious tradition. We are a Protestant Christian country, but... Uh, there is not much of a religious population left. But Cult created a shock when it was released in Sweden because it was sell sold in the toy stores and it was very violent and it was very sexual. And I think that also created some uproar. And there was a new Christian organization, sort of like Jehovah's Witnesses, but a, a sort of new cult that has sort of established themselves in Sweden and they sort of viewed cult as sort of the the tool to corrupt the children of Sweden into Satanism and and uh, well turn them into sort of violent Satanist militaries and this was at the same time um, because in in 1991 and 1992 in Norway at the same time you had the, like the black metal movement with like church burnings and murders and Satanism so there was this whole zeitgeist of sort of an occult movement that was viewed on as quite mm -hmm. dangerous. And and so there was a lot of debates in, in, in Sweden from Christian organizations, but also like parental groups that sort of banished role-playing games from the toy stores, cult and all other role-playing games. Uh, and there was also some a murder in Sweden that was quite spectacular um, where... 
where one were sort of in the beginning they were sort of suspecting that perhaps cult had been you know involved in that in some way because they they had played cult together um when you meant when you mentioned it, when you mentioned a um okay okay when you mentioned a murder that had happened um there was a story that i thought that i thought that i thought was involved but no that that was in norway not in not in sweden so that didn't count um well there there, there was a disappearance in norway that also was said to be connected to cult but the one in sweden was two young men killing a, a, like luring away sort of a a friend and murdering him and then sort of go on with their daily lives as if nothing happened and but but i mean they they were deeply troubled people and i wouldn't say that cult had anything to do with it but it, it it sort of it came during that time when the debate about role playing games in sweden uh, in general was sort of at its at its peak so it it didn't really it fueled the fires so to speak mm -hmm. um but e but even but even with that now ob obviously there there was a there were there were certainly some some moments of controversy here in the states but seeing the, seeing that particular seeing that particular zeitgeist um is in, is interesting at least from my perspective because obviously I'm on the outside looking in on that kind of thing um and I'd say and even ever since there there seemed to be this this um weird notion and may, maybe you had seen this as, as well in some in some of your circles that you could draw you could draw inspir you could draw inspiration from all these different mythologies you could draw inspiration from from Norse from from um from, from Egyptian from from, Br from British what ha what have you but for some reason, the idea of of, draw, of drawing fr of drawing from um, Christian mythos is some is somehow taboo, which I always found yeah. amusing, especially given. Look, I I was reading indie comics as much as anybody else in the '90s, and when you had stuff like Spawn going about that, um, pe that people were raising a stink about. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think it's, I think it's, I mean, I, I understand in a way why it is like that, but I think it's, it's of course, hilarious in many ways. I mean, I, I, I you know, the, the, the game which is Scion, with like where you play like it's a sort of American gods inspired white wolf game where you are mm -hmm. playing the, the offspring of the gods, so you can be sort of the, the son of Thor or the daughter of. Hermes or or and you can have all these divine pantheons but of course you don't have the Christians anywhere it's not like you are you are the the spawn at least to my knowledge perhaps they have some sort of side module where you can be the, the, not, the son of God. not officially um no. someone did someone did do someone did do that in when it came to fan creation um now now I will I will preface by saying I have not looked at Scion second edition um but dur but during the first edition run there what there was there there um there was somebody who put who put in um christian pantheons um i i remember he i remember i remember hearing some rumor and it may it may not it may not have been a thing that there was talk about putting something like that in the compan in the scion companion but it ne but it never materialized um but it's just it's just kind of funny to me, and then the, then this whole thing was revisited when the um, Dark Siders video games um, came out. Yeah, but but I think I mean for for a lot of people, um, I mean it's, there's it's a reason why we call Christianity a religion and Norse religion is really a mythology, even though there are several people that are religious in the Norse religions uh, in some parts of the world. Mm -hmm. um, but it is this kind of new resurgence, uh, naturistic religion. 
so so I think that the, the the whole reason, of course, that people are upset is because a lot of people see the Christian Christian religion or the Muslim or Jewish religion as the real thing. And of course, cult is, is in and as its core uh, based on the Jewish mythology and the, mm -hmm. the Gnostic Christian ideas. Um, so, so yeah, it's hard to escape from from that part in cult. It's like if you remove that, you remove sort of. They try to do it in the second edition of cult, but uh, the second Swedish edition. But then you sort of remove the the fundament of like what makes cult special in a way. So it doesn't really work. Mm -hmm. Now, when it came to Divinity Lost. Um, now what now um I've now um I rem I had, I had delved a bit into into third edition and that and then then um cult just dis then just cult just disappeared. Um what I'm curious about is what is what what prom what what was the prompting for um or rather not the prompting but how how did the story come about as far as getting the the um the, the ability to do um cult um a cult reboot yeah i mean i think it's important to mention that i have written quite a lot of role playing games before cult that are published in sweden in swedish so i had done quite a lot of role playing games with friends and i worked in a role playing game company in the early 2000s and but cult was never meant to be a real project. It started as a fan hack of, of Apocalypse World. Um, me and a friend, Marco, who is also in a Helmghast, met uh, a guy called Robin. And Robin played Apocalypse World with us. And, we, and it was really fun. And he said, like, you know what? I, have made a, I would like to try to play cult with these rules. And we were like, yeah, cool. Yeah, we want. I, I love cult, so of course I wanted to join. And he he sort of made a first. We made a first adventure and we played it, and we felt, wow, this really works. It it really it fits the theme of cult and the setting. Um, so, and that was just a fan hack. And me and Robin was sort of working with it. He was writing rules and making played. And we played it a lot, and I was making the artwork. I'm I'm. I'm a writer, but I do mm -hmm. some art. And, and for this fan hack, I was like, yeah, but we need some art. So I will do some some art for this. And we had a, you know, it was, we were planning to release it free on the internet. So we had a blog where you, people could download the playbooks and all the rules and everything was in Swedish. Um, and then I guess we had, and, and, and we did that for a long time. And with no plans of making it into a real game. And then somewhere along the line, I just felt that this feels so good. Perhaps we can get the license to make like a Swedish version of Cult. So first we connect, contacted the original writers, Mikael and Gunilla. And they said like, yeah, sure, you can do it if you want to. Uh, but you can't call it cult because we don't have the rights to the text. So you can you can use the same mythology because, of course, it's Jewish mythology. So feel free. But then we contacted the the, the ones that had the license and showed them what we had. And they say, like, yeah, sure, you can do it. But then we need to have it in English. And then it was like, oh, OK, well, I guess we need to make the game then. So I, I think we started doing cult divinity lost in like 2014 perhaps i mean or, or like cult the, the the cult fan hack i don't remember but it has been an, a long time we have been making this mm -hmm. or even more perhaps 2010 i don't even remember but it started as a fan hack we presented it to the the ones that had the license and then we realized we have to write the game in english so that's the that's the story behind the reboot yeah. Um now in that in that regard instead now instead of using the original roll under d20 approach you went with um powered by the apocalypse as a skeleton for it. 
what I'm curious mm. about is what prompted you to go with that system specifically? Well, um, since it was a fan hack of Apocalypse World, I mean, it was a time when everyone sort of made their own fan hacks. And we have, I think that Cult is sort of the, it's part traditional role playing games like the old Cult, and then it's part sort of the newer kind Apocalypse World style. What I think works well for Cult is that I really like the basic mechanic that you roll in Cult's case 2d10 plus an attribute score, and either you have like uh, a complication or you have a success with a complication. Mm. or you have a full success. I think that creates cool stories. It's a very quick system. It's super easy for new players. It's harder for the GM in some ways. Um, but for new players, it's super easy to grasp and, and play with. So it's a quick system that works very well with horror. Uh, and I think that the old cult had a lot of, I think you had like 100 skills on the character sheets. Everything like from parachute jumping to double shot and dancing and acrobatics. It was the nineties. <laughs> yeah, the nineties. And they had like weapon lists with an abundance of weapons and kung fu moves. It was very action oriented. So, and and you had a lot of rules for like you know driving with cars in high velocity and make these advanced maneuvers. So it was much more of an action game. Mm -hmm. And and uh, and we moved cult away from that to the more, I would call, personal horror ish setting. So so I mean it was a fan hack. So so it was so natural that it would be based on that rule set. Um, oh, yeah, <laughs> it was it was Robin's idea to make cult on on the on the rules. So he's sort of the the master of the rules, and I think it works very well. Yeah. Now, obvious, obviously, with obviously with that, you're trying you're trying to shift to emphasizing the horror part of it instead instead of trying to emphasize the action thing. Which, for what it's worth, I think the action I think that action part of it was a consequence of a trend that was going around in the '90s of trying to um, put a, put a little put a little something for just about everything. Yeah, I mean, the 90s was, was, I mean, I played a lot of Vampire, and it was always like, yeah, I have a Katana, and I have an Uzi, and I have a shotgun with Dragon Breath rounds. The Sabbath is in town. It is raining. Let's go to the Goth Club and meet the Toreador and get some information. It was sort of the, <laughs> that yeah. kind of, yeah. <laughs> um, to White Wolf's credit, at the time, they, um, they were perfectly willing to make fun of themselves. Regard regarding that stereotype, you know, with the whole dudes of legend April Fools joke that they pulled. Yeah, I mean, I I have nothing against White Wolf. I I I have played an insane amount of uh, of uh, White Wolf games, and Vampire is a game I hold very close to my heart, and um, especially Vampire: The Dark Ages is a game I find is really splendid for this. If you, I really love these long, intriguing political campaigns, and, and I think Vampire is great at that. It's like Game of Thrones with fangs. Um, but with now, when it comes to when it comes when it comes to um the art when it comes to the shift when it comes to the whole archetype based approach that Powered by the Apocalypse has. Were there obviously there were probably some things that were easier to transfer over, and there were some things that were more difficult to. Um, what would what would be a few examples that you can think of, of mechanics from um, original continuity cult that were that ha that required a bit more legwork to try and go to try and go into this new system? Yeah, well, I, I think that old cult, of course, had the archetypes as a concept, but it, mm -hmm. it it didn't really, it said what kind of skills you could sort of pick, but, and, and had suggested, but they didn't, you, I mean, 
I think you just looked at the image and like, oh, I will be a, a, a city samurai or a femme fatale or mm -hmm. the Avenger. Um, and what I think that the, the playbooks and Apocalypse World did very well is that you could create very distinct characters. We, I mean, we looked and we kept sort of the dark secrets, the, the disadvantages and the advantages, and then sort of just reimagined them for for Divinity Lost. And it was not, I mean, this is really in Robin's table that he, he made the work with the archetypes. I made some of the concepts because I really liked the, we, I mean, a lot of the archetypes are almost like professions, like you're the artist or you are the, you're the Ronin or you're the veteran. But I really liked what Cult had. Uh, for example, they had the archetype, the Avenger, which is really, you are seeking vengeance. That is your archetype. So we added more like the broken or the dull and and, and those archetypes that are not not the what you are and what you do, but more like what drives you or how people look at you. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I I think that those archetypes became very very strong and and interesting because I think they are a bit different. And one of the things I definitely did notice is the fact that even though this is using um, powered by the apocalypse, um, I wouldn't I wouldn't. I'd be a little hard now. Obviously, I don't know what the original um, ha the original hack that you guys had looked like, but the current the current form that I have in front of me, um, I'd hesitate to call to call that a a straight up hack of Powered by the Apocalypse in in its current form, simply because, um, like even even with those archetypes, a it's not exactly the same as. Um, as playbooks that you that one would see in a, a standard hack part in part because of the fact that um th that each archetype doesn't have it doesn't have a set of moves associated with it in I mean granted you've got it you've got advantages which could co could come close but the the whole the whole con the whole concept within that as well as the fact that attributes were expanded um kind of di kind of differs it away from being a from being a straight adaptation was that something that just happened with time or what or um were there moments where the core rule set for powered by the apocalypse just wasn't quite fitting what you were trying to do i mean this was um i mean the, the original hack was was a hack of powered by the apocalypse mm -hmm. and it was much closer you had the standard attributes you have in powered by apocalypse but we have had renamed them and then you roll two d6s uh and it was very similar but during the process when we were creating divinity lost we expanded and changed things uh, because of the nature of the game and 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 sort of the theme of the of the story and I think that I pushed a lot of the sort of traditional role-playing game view into cult, and Robin pushed a lot of the more powered by the apocalypse uh, view of cult in, uh, of, of the game. Mm -hmm. So, so um, I, I really wanted the game master to have more power in cult because it's a horror game. So, the game master should be able to dictate more things, like when when a player may trigger a move and things like that. And and the, the attribute was changed to make broader characters. Uh, and, and also we wanted 10 attributes because the number of 10 is very important in the cult mythology. And each attribute sort of symbolizes one of the powers that imprisons us. And um, um, yeah, so there was a lot of changes over time because we played it a lot. Robin game mastered it a lot. I game mastered it and we tested it. I mean, the, we had many versions of this sort of system to handling like injuries and death. And mm -hmm. uh, so we, we sort of expanded it and we wanted to have it sort of a, a broader scale. So we wanted two D10s because we knew we wanted to expand it into the more enlightened archetypes where you are more powerful. 
but we still didn't want to change like the core set of the rules and so so yeah it, but it, it, it sort of grew naturally into what it is today there are some powered by the apocalypse fans that hates it because it's not powered by the apocalypse uh, at its core uh, i mean at its core it is of course but it's 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 more traditional role-playing game sense in a while mm -hmm. in a way so so yeah which, but I think it's found its own ground, which I think is good. Yeah, which, which um, the I think it's one it's one of those things where um, a lot I've no I've noticed with Powered by the Apocalypse and some and some other games that a lot of people have the mindset that the, that um, that the core that the core mechanics can be this one size fits all approach, um, and that's not necessarily the case. In fact. The first, the first Powered by the Apocalypse game I reviewed was a um, was a wrestling game called Worldwide Wrestling, and um, it wasn't bad. But the problem is, Powered by the Apocalypse just doesn't, um, in a vanilla sense, just doesn't fit what I would expect of a wrestling game. Namely, the fact that that whole um, archetype or playbook thing does does not work when there's an expectation of going full customized, as there has been since 1997. Um, yeah, yeah, but, but but I think that that's that's fair to say, and I think mm -hmm. that the, I mean, powered by the apocalypse, in some ways, became the the GURPS of indie games, like the the role playing game GURPS was like we have a system that fits all kind of games. If you want to play fantasy or sci fi or Wild West, you have the same system, but the system itself, I mean you might want to have a different flavor in the game and then you can say like oh but just add these rules but it's not the same thing and i think it's exactly the same thing with powered by the apocalypse that something that something that i've noticed and maybe and maybe you maybe you've seen this as well is that there seems to be there seems to be less and less of a trend of trying to do the oh it, oh it's for it's for every amount and more of trying to do a more curated experience within a within a given genre um, yeah, I think I think it's the trend uh, of today. I uh, clearly, I I sort of like it because you you can play that genre. Very, I mean, the system is sort of focused on this is a system for like horror stories. Mm -hmm. I love the game Dread, which is played with a Jenga tower. I think it's perfect for like tales of horror, no matter what. As long as you're a group of survivors that are going to survive horror, it's perfect. But at the same same time, I really like these broad general systems where you have a world, and you have a system, and it's really up to the players to decide what kind of game are we playing in this world. So, I'm sort of torn between the two. Yeah. Now, when it now um, when it comes to now, obvious obviously there's. A lot. There's a lot of um. There's a lot of emphasis on on the particular themes with on the particular themes within um. Within a within a game like Cult, and especially since you're emphasizing the horror aspects of it. Um. That brings me to a question of how do how do how do you how do you um. How do you keep a consistent horror feel at your table? Because now, obviously, every table is going to be different. But I'm curious how you're able, how you, how you, fe how you feel about maintaining that sense of atmosphere, so that people don't go too silly with the um, horror as when it try when it's trying to be a horror game. Yeah. Well, first of all, uh, I. I don't expect to have a consistent atmosphere for all of the session or all mm -hmm. of the game because I think that horror is built on that you need to have this. It's like the the arcs. You need to have times when players are feeling more safe and they need to recuperate. And then you can build the suspense and go towards the horrific. And then, because horror, when you have reached its peak, it's sort of it's it sort of goes down again and instead of like everything becomes splatter or just the horror becomes 
okay, <laughs> I mean, the players don't feel it. It's really good to sort of go back into the the sense of normality or, or, or sense of relief because you need that sort of roller coaster ride. But I think that um, I really pl- talk with the players and with the group and says like, okay, we are going to play a horror scenario right now. We're going to play cult. This is a horror game. So, and I, I try to convey the notion that we are to, together, we are creating the atmosphere. So if this is a sort of, this is a joint effort, if, if, if we are starting to fool around too much and, and, and sort of it becomes too silly and we're sort of out of character and, you know, in a very you know, tense scene, someone is like picking up their phone or like talk, start talking about ordering pizza or the band they're going to see the week, the next weekend. Mm-hmm. We are, they are breaking the sort of social contract that we are going to create a horror game. And I think if you can, just talk to the players say like this is almost like in the first beginning of the session like we're going to play cult this is your characters all right and this is something we build together so think about this and you can have like try to not look at that much of your phones and then i really like love to use music in the background to create this ambience and 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 all that but i i I really think just talking to the players and have them invested that this is something we do together it's not the game master's role only to create the atmosphere of the setting it's also the player's role to uh, to help with that mm-hmm. and in the since you mentioned music i did want to ask about that what sort i'm curious what sort of music you you um fall you fall back on in order to create that atmosphere or does it vary from session to session well it varies but we there is this genre called dark ambience with bands like Lust Mood, Atrium Carceri, Dahlia's Tear, Mechano Receptor, and similar that is mm-hmm. almost like noise in a way, but it, it's like it, it, it's a music that just creates an atmosphere of sort of foreboding dread. And actually during the Kickstarter campaign, we, we made a, a soundtrack uh, for for cult is like I think it's three hours almost mm-hmm. with this dark ambient noise and uh, the man putting that together Ryan Northcott who sadly isn't with us anymore he he really got himself invested and pulled together a lot of big names in the scene and and uh, put together a really cool soundtrack with with. Uh, yeah, that 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 fits the the atmosphere of cult, and he he tied the different songs to the different sort of dimensions and worlds of cults. Um, and, and I think that that kind of music works very well because it does it's not intrusive, it's not dramatic, it's just there in the background and has the, almost this majestic and 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 haunting feeling to it. Yeah. I I will ad- I will admit that in s- that and my, my my musical taste might be a bit odd in this. Um, one of the one of the bands that I had used semi consistently when it came to um, when it came when it came to set when it came to setting up atmosphere of all of all bands was um, Sun. Hmm. But that's the drone. Or am I thinking about the right band? Is it called like Sun O, or how is it spelled? Yeah, yeah, that's the that's yeah. the one. And um, yeah, I, but I I will admit I ma- I mainly used their music whenever whenever I wanted to establish the presence of the um, supernatural, namely to sh- namely to show that there is something not um not right with what's going on. Yeah, but I I mean I think that they are clearly bordering into the sort of the ambient feel i mean you can use dead can dance for cult as well it has this this almost trance you you almost go into a trance when you are listening to that kind of music Uh, i i also use it a lot when i'm writing that kind of music that is sort of 
um, in the background and just give give an emotion. So I, I don't think it's a strange choice indeed. It would be weirder if you played, I don't know, Judas Priest when you're playing a <laughs> horror game. Um, I mean, maybe maybe if they're maybe if they're in a um, maybe if they're in a club or something. But <laughs> no, no, the the closest. I if I'm gonna go that if I'm gonna go that route, then the closest I'd go with is Demu Borgir, and even and even then I wouldn't do it. Yeah, no, no, I I I, I agree. I, I mean, I, I I listen to a lot of black metal sometimes when I write because I think they have the same kind of of um, of ambience and the same kind of feeling uh, that is sort of tied to the core of the music, and and it in a way it also becomes very when you listen beyond the blast beats and the screams, you mm -hmm. sort of just have the melodies that are sort of slowly moving in the background. So I think it works well. Yeah. Right um, for that. Philip I, Glass's works work um, does well as uh, also. Yeah, the, uh, his music is very haunting. Mm -hmm. it, it it is. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I like it as well. But now, I've, now, um, when it can't now. Now, obviously, there, there's been a, um, up to this point, there's been a core rule book, a player's guide, and recently a set of um, adventures. Now, what would you, given, given how development is a, ver is a very active process, what would you say were some of the big learning experiences you, you took from, the, from, um, from after, the, after uh, Divinity Lost was released? Well, I mean, the big learning we took from the the Kickstarter of Divinity Lost because we kickstarted the core book, mm -hmm. and and the, the player's guide was actually just a small thing for the Kickstarter. But we had like, like a game master scream, a tarot deck, uh, a campaign called the Black Madonna, which was only released in Swedish and French for some reason, and Taroticum and other tales, which is a sort of a scenario collection. Mm -hmm. Uh, what we learned from that was it takes a lot of extra time doing a lot of extra products. So we are trying to be more uh, finished product because we were almost, I would say, one or two years late with the Kickstarter deliveries because it was just so much extra work finishing all up. Um, so I, I think that's the, 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 the learnings when it comes to the... Well, do you, do you think least, do you think that you um, bit off more than you could chew at first? Well, yeah. I mean, I think we set a completely unrealistic deadline, and that we um, I mean, we promised a lot of things in the Kickstarter. All of those things we have delivered. So it, it's not that we failed to deliver on them, but we should have realized that when we are adding a lot of things, uh, of course, it will take more time because we need to have art and editing and you know layout and and um, and all that. So it, it, I mean, it it became a massive job to sort of publish the game, ship the game, and all that. Mm -hmm. and, and also, we had the, we had this. Um, um, the first, the original idea of Cult was, of course, that we, the Kickstarter edition of the rulebook is, of course, uncensored because we had a lot of nudity and, and violence and occult themes and nipples and things, erect penises as well, I think. And our distributor was like, oh my God, you can't put this in the shelf in a business. So the Kickstarter edition is, is the uncensored one and then we sort of made a retail edition that is sort of but then we had to go back and fix the pictures or change the pictures and sort of it's still kind of i mean it's still a horror game so mm -hmm. we, i think it's kind of spectacular but we have to remove some themes that are sensitive especially in some countries like the united states uh <laughs> like sex is not it's very sensitive have i i have learned in there yeah um, yeah there's um Look, I, look. I have a saying: those who go out looking for witches see them everywhere. <laughs> I'll just leave it at that. Yeah, yeah, a little bit like that. So, so, but I mean, that was also learning that 
we could of course have been like okay let's redo the whole all of the books but i really felt that i wanted to give the original for the kickstarter backers and then we had to do a new version so it was just a lot a big process and but i think that the biggest learning is that there is always unexpected things happening and so when you're like doing a kickstarter you are putting a a deadline mm -hmm. that is what you are aiming for but then it might be like someone might die which has happened or people are disappearing or someone gets sick so it's it's really hard to to foresee everything that might come in our way so so that was sort of the learning from the from the from the shipping aspect and and delivery of the game i would say I don't know if that answered your question. I, I blame the wine right now if I'm babbling. <laughs> no, don't no, don't worry too, don't worry about it. Um, when it now, when it came to when it came to you mentioned that the Black Madonna um, didn't ha didn't have a didn't have a widespread release at first. Why why would you why do you suppose that was? Cult was, I mean, it was a very big campaign, so it's a lot of work to translate it and 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 publish it. Um, and Cult created some controversy, and and there was this wave in the early '90s where horror role-playing games. It was during the time of the Satanic Panic, and Vampire mm -hmm. came under fire, and Cult came under fire. And the Pope actually banned cult in Italy. So it was sort of a, a chaotic time. And the game company that had the right for cult then decided to try to make cult a little bit more, more nice, or at least remove the religious themes and add more like gore, because gore is something that is okay. And I think the Black Madonna has some aspects that are very religious with the sort of the in in its core of the game. So I think that when did it, it, it was never an idea to translate it to 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 English because it was so big. So I think they were sort of more aiming to release Cult in English, the second edition, and make it more friendly, and then just create new material with with the, native english speakers for that game um and and that didn't really happen because the the second edition is a weaker game than than uh, in the first edition mm -hmm. i would say um so I, I don't really know the idea behind it i don't think that the black madonna did sell that well in sweden i i mean it it became sort of legendary but i think yeah. As I, as I say, I think that most of those that played Cult was between 14 and 16. Perhaps some was a little bit older. And we, I think that we were a bit too immature for the game as such. So I don't know. Uh, I think that these grand campaigns, it was very hard to finish them. Because, yeah. no, And, and the, the Black Madonna is also a very action-oriented. So it's a lot of storming military bases and we, we tried to sort of tone that down a little bit and rewrite it for the new edition but but it's still it's still you can see that it's classic cult but i really like it now because i think the black madonna is more interesting now actually because it's sort of a a time stamp of the 90s when i read it now it's like really interesting to see like the room descriptions with like every room has an ashtray and it's like everyone is smoking it is really a time stamp of Europe and the Soviet Union in the nineties. It's very interesting. Mm -hmm. And obviously, um, obviously, it, it's something like that's going to provide an interesting time stamp for pe for people outside of Europe as well. Um, which... Yeah, I think I think I think that the Black Madonna is works very well to play even i i guess there are things that you might perhaps want to look into a little bit more but thankfully we have 
the internet and Wikipedia. And we actually added a whole new chapter of the Black Madonna that's sort of an intro chapter where you create your characters so they are more tied into the campaign because in, in, back, back in the days, uh, the idea was that the players just created their characters and then they were just thrown into a campaign like, okay, you have your characters, now we just push you into the campaign. But we, in Cult of Lost, we are much more focused on that the characters should be tied to the campaign because the story should be about them in some way. So now their characters are tied to the Black uh, to the Black Madonna in a more thematical way. Mm -hmm. And But we also added a whole segment about this is the world in 1991. So you sort of understand the setting and what what kind of technology exists and what doesn't what is sort of the political aspects in europe with a sort of a crumbling soviet union and and that whole time yeah now obviously it's been, obviously it's um obviously the uh, most recent addition to cult's um sandbox was the horror guide and scenario collection um, which do you, do you consider now when I had, when I had found out about that, I had, cons I'd considered it, um, a, a, um, set that's more skewed towards the GM end of things and the player end of things. Would that be accurate? Yeah, I would, I would say it's, it's much more towards the game master than the, than the, than the players. Um, um, Especially the the horror guide, of course. That's that's really a tool for creating horror mm -hmm. um, in various forms. But I think that the the writer Jason Fryer he he really found a different take on it because we read through a lot of the sort of books about how to game master horror for all other role playing games, and I would say this is a completely different take on it and and how you tie it into the cult mythology and what kind of horror stories you want to tell yeah and, and the, the scenario collection is it's really a scenario where we're focusing a lot about on on human drama this i think that we i don't it depends on what we will do i think that right now we we have a campaign plan and we have some other products that are sort of waiting to to be finalized before we have a a kickstarter but um the, this scenario collection we i really wanted to focus more on sort of the human drama so it's much closer to closer to the heart and, and closer to to personal tragedies uh while the black madonna for example is very much a grand epic uh, going into other dimensions fighting monsters with machine guns um in that regard do you do you think that do you think that cult is a game that le that can lend itself to long form campaigns or do you or do you think that it um leans more toward leans more towards more episodic affairs? I, I mean, cult is great for one shots, but I think um, the whole concept in the core rules is to create a campaign about the player characters. When you are so when you are making a campaign with it's very apocalypse world in that sense. You are mm -hmm. choosing your dark secrets. You are making an intrigue map together. So you have a session zero where you gather, you discuss what kind of campaign will we create, what archetypes will we use. The game master may have a several, several suggestions that we should play. A science team on Antarctica will be teenagers in West Virginia, or we will be. Uh, sailors in the Pacific in the Middle Ages or whatever and we just find the the archetypes that is fitting for the story and then you sort of build a story around the characters and their dark secrets and then you play it and I would say I would say it can be from four to seven or eight sessions then I think around there the story tends to have resolved itself and that's sort of the that's the campaign. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think cult works exceptionally well for that because you are really telling the story about the characters. But they are, but cult is not uh, like Call of Cthulhu with these massive, massive stories like Beyond the Mountains of Madness or Masks of Niralote. 
we need a lot of that. The closest we have is the Black Madonna, but cult is much more about the player characters. So the player characters are important to the story. So you can sort of expect the story to revolve around them more than some grand plot, I would say. All right, I can. So I... the, so so I I would say that you can you can you can play campaigns, but they will probably not be as long or as epic as as uh, as saving the world from an old one in in uh, masks of Niralototep. Mm -hmm. Nobody can ever figure out how to how to pronounce that. Then again, I think no, that's I, the point. Yeah, <laughs> I guess so. Um, it's the reason I'm not going to get on anybody for 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 what the right way to say Cthulhu is, because the whole point is that it's supposed to be unpronounceable. Yeah, it's like Tsimishi or Tsimishi or Tsimish or mm -hmm. that vampire clan that everyone has a different pronunciation of. Look, I I just I just know that the that that the only clan I don't allow people to play is Malkavians. Yeah, I, I think Malkavians are, in a way, I find them very interesting, but they always tend to become sort of the clowns. They always become weird and sort of the... the uh, always, I guess there are good Malkavians as well, but for me, the times I played Vampire, they, they tend to be... The, Silly in a way, and I, I, I think, I think, I think the pro I think the problem is, um, is there they've been they've been subject to flanderization. Um, if you'll if that if you'll forgive me for making a um, t if you'll forgive me for making a TV tropes reference in the sense that, yes, they are yes their gift is chaos, um, effe effectively an extreme version of the butterfly effect. But I feel like pe I feel like a lot of people took the chaos part of that and ran with it too much. And personally, I've the idea of an individual Malkavian is something I've been fine with. The idea of a clan of Malkavians is counterproductive. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I kind of like the idea of Malkavians in the way that these. Their forefather Malkave, and in their blood there is a madness, but there is also an insight into the unknown, and they 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 have these powers and visions that are are really valuable. I, I think the problem with the original Malkavians was that why are they even allowed in in the city? They seem to be a danger to everyone, to the masquerade, and to be an annoyance. If they had like if they would have, would have been the only ones with the uh, Auspex discipline, for example, then I could see that they are, you need to have the Malkavian advisor or, or call the Malkavians for help. But 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 I like them as a concept, but I think, think they tend to become, yeah, it's like, oh, we have a Malkavian in the party and you know that probably the Malkavian will just screw it up. And then it's more like, why, why is we, why are we bringing this individual with us? So mm -hmm. it, it, it takes the right kind of player to sort of portray a Malkavian in an interesting way. I'm, I mean, it can be done, but I think that the most experience I have had of Malkavians have been a bit wonky. Yeah, but um, but with but with that with that kind of thing in in mind now. When it comes now, when it comes to the um, horror guiding sc and scenario collection, um, after what do you sh now? If if I'm not mistaken, that's still in um, de that's still in development and still getting updated. Like I don't, it's been it's been a while since I checked, but I don't think that's um, been fully released yet. No, we we have said Q one twenty twenty one. So mm -hmm. at the and the end of like. February, March, I guess we were aiming to release it. And as of now, it looks kind of good that we will keep it. Several things are are finished or finalized. So, mm -hmm. and we're proofing, proofreading a lot of the scenarios and they will be layouted. And so it looks kind of good. Yeah. Um, and I'll, I'll definitely be keeping an eye out on, um, 
on how on how it develops. Yeah, I, I, I also just want to tell you and of course listeners that on our homepage, uh, cultdivinitylost.com, I think we have like seven or eight or perhaps nine scenarios that you can just download for free. Uh, so if you just want to have like play something, there is just just grab it. So there is a lot of free material as, as well. Mm hmm. And of, co and of course, that's all. That's all. Um, that's all. Open open season when it comes when it comes to digging into that. But with that in mind, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to um, come onto the show and enjoy the madness that come that happens in the temple. Oh no, no problem. It was really nice, and I had opportunity to open the bottle of wine that had been standing on my shelf for some time. So it was really good. <laughs> Um, I will never, I will, I will never leave, I will never leave a good, a good bottle of drink go unused. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. That's good. Um, whether or not it, whether or not that count, whether or not that counts as blasphemy in my book, I'll leave that up to you. Well, well, I, I think that, uh, one of the good things about the, the Christian religion, I don't know what religion you are of, it's of course that, um, drinking is allowed, I would mm -hmm. say, so it's good. Um, but with any time, and of course, anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. Um, as I always say, drinking is not mandatory around here, but it is encouraged. <laughs> That's good. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you so much for having me. Mm -hmm. And of course, a sincere thanks to everybody who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>